Hi, I'm Randall, co-host of The Drumming Show. We're pleased to bring you episode one in four short chapters. Our guests are Scott Paulson and Barb Smith, professional steel drum players and educators from the Vermont Independent School of the Arts. Our host, Bob Sparadeo, learns about the musical background of these two fine musicians. By the way, if you want to watch the entire show in one piece as it was originally recorded, please visit us at cnow.tv. That's C-N-O-W TV. Now let's get started with Chapter 1, Scott Paulson and Barb Smith. Hey, it's time for the drumming show. It's the show about drumming and drummers and whatever kind of drumming you do, wherever your skill level is at, we've got something for you here. And when we talk about, you know, any kind of drumming, today's show is going to just show you a little bit about that, exactly what we mean. We have some great talent here for you today, and it's going to be a wonderful time. Glad you're joining us. Uh, but before we get to that, let me introduce the host of the show, a fabulous drummer. I've heard him play many, many times. He is, uh, he has a lot of history, and we're going to hear some of it today, and he's going to bring a lot of good, interesting information for all of us. And that is Bob Sparadale is the host of the show. And thank you for being here, Bob. Randall, thanks so much for having us aboard. Uh, we're going to be having a lot of fun, um, mainly explaining drumming in its entirety. And uh, its appeal will range from the professionals to people that are just starting and may have a, an inkling that it might be a fun thing to do. Um, so uh, hold on to your hats, going to be a lot of fun. And let's get started. All right. Sounds great, Bob. Why don't you introduce uh, our fabulous guest here? We are very, very pleased to have two amazing musicians with us, Scotty Paulson and Barb Smith. Um, widely known in the area um, and beyond, uh, all up and down the East Coast. Um, and I should explain, the show comes from beautiful Vermont, which is in New England, the Northeast part of the U.S. Uh, for those uh, either living in California or geographically challenged. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what we will be going after in some of our conversations with these two amazing musicians is the process to become a professional musician and the amount of focus and determination it takes to get where you guys have been. So I guess a good place to start would be Scotty, what got you first interested in music? Well, uh, it was very much a family occupation. Uh, both of my parents were music teachers in public schools, and my father later in a community college nearby where we lived. Um, he played professionally, gigged on several instruments, um, piano, bass guitar. He played bass trombone with the Albany Symphony. My mother taught choral, drama in the local schools was actually a baritone horn major in college. So music was always in the house. Dad always played jazz piano. Um, I got interested in drums at a young age. And I remember at one anniversary party they had, you know, I got my little snare drum out, my little Mickey Mouse snare drum and a little cymbal and he was playing jazz and I had the brushes out. And so I started from a very young age. Three sisters, a cello player, a French horn player, country guitar player, they all sang, and me, so I couldn't escape. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. There was a while that I tried, but I could not stay and away music from music. And music does grab hold of you. Really, it was just such a part of my life, and it's, when you're brought up that way, it's just what you know, and it's not like, oh, I decided to go into music, it's, you know, and honestly, I, I really did try to do other things for a while, and it just, it didn't work for me. The only thing that worked was music, so it's always been there. Tell us about your education. Um, coming up through, I first took lessons on snare drum and then percussion and played in rock bands. You know, this is the, uh, the KISS era, you know, <laughs> so that's the type of stuff I was listening to. I didn't hear a lot of rock and roll early on because my father being a jazz player just, you know, was kind of, uh, you don't want to listen to that kind of stuff, even though my sisters were because they were older. Um, but finally, I, you know, through friends of mine, and I'm like, oh, this Led Zeppelin isn't too bad, you know, in the in the Kiss and you know Eric Clapton and all that stuff. So uh, then I was in the the Kiss type band where we were doing a lot of that type of stuff and playing drum set. And um, eventually, I got tired of being stuck in one place. 
because the guitar players were all like jumping around and doing all the posturing and it's like oh that looks really cool I'd like to do that <laughs> so um, the next logical progression after that was bass guitar because it was seemingly easier to learn how to do than um, guitar so I started a uh, Luckily, at that time, my father was teaching out of college. They had a spare bass guitar that nobody was playing, so he brought it home. Um, and over a summer, I started learning Rush, and that's I was getting into Rush at that point, <laughs> which explains why I play so much jazz and country now. <laughs> <laughs> that's largely because we live in Vermont, but and I love that too. Um, but came up through there, worked in a music store, got an associate's degree in music, started repairing instruments. Went out to Minnesota to learn how to do that properly, during which time I had to learn how to play the wind instruments enough that I could play test them and make sure that they were operating correctly. So then um, came back east again. The school was in Minnesota. Came back east um, to Vermont, where I worked for a large company, Ellis Music Company, that rents musical instruments, repairing instruments for them. Um, then was still playing bass guitar and drums in rock bands, but then uh, started this band named Skabaza that um, I played saxophone as one of the instruments. And that during that era, that time, I, I wanted to try something different because I always like to pick up new instruments and try them. So um, I'd been in Puerto Rico on a vacation and saw a little steel band. I was just really intrigued with the sound, but also the fact that the music was so happy and upbeat. I really liked that. There was nothing like that anywhere around here going on. So I started doing research and found that it was very difficult to even locate a steel drum. It's not, you can't go to a local music store to find one. They're even kind of hard to find online. Well, they were at that time. Um, so, but a friend of mine said, oh, I know this guy up in Montpelier who plays steel drum. And uh, I heard he might be wanting to sell one. So I met this guy and he was building a boat in his basement to sail to Trinidad and only had one room enough for one steel drum to take with him. And so I went up to meet him and here is the bow of a boat sticking out of his basement with no possible way of getting the rest of the boat out of there. So he was a very eccentric, interesting guy. So I ended up buying a steel drum from him and bringing it home and, you know, sitting there with my little Casio, figuring out where the notes were and writing them on the drum. And that was probably about in 1996 or so. So that's when the whole steel drum thing started. But I ended up playing the steel drum as well with that band, Skabaza. And um, we played up in Burlington a lot. And one of like Fish's crew saw us play. And we got invited to go out to Lemon Wheel, which is a festival in northern Maine in 1998, and play play our shtick out on the, on the field and to throngs of people. So that was really exciting. But after playing Steel Pan for a couple of years, you know, I, there are several voices of Steel Pan. That was the highest one that I was playing, the lead pan, and I still do play that. Um, but I started picking up some of the lower ones and I'm starting to teach other people how to do it. And about at this time, you know, uh, Barb and I started working on this nonprofit music school together. So, and I was still teaching. I had done some teaching in schools, like jazz bands and things like that. But... Um, was really starting to focus more on just steel drums, percussion, bass. She was a woodwind professional, so uh, I'm like, okay, you take my saxophone <laughs> students and my clarinet students and the flute students, and I'll just kind of focus on this. So we've had our band now, the big band, for 10 years, and I uh, suckered her into <laughs> learning another voice of steel pan so that we do it as a duo, and we've been doing that for going on 10 years, right? Yeah, 10 years. That's the short story. All right. <laughs> and for folks that picked up on the fact the, that the pan might be interesting, if you're looking for a place to find out, the show's the place. And you'd stay with us because you're going to figure that out. <laughs> but right now, we'll, we'll try to catch up and, and get your lovely fiancé's input on where you, what inspired you to begin and where that took you. Well, I started playing flute when I was in fourth grade. I was 10 years old and music was a part of my family as well. Maybe not so much like it was in Scott's family. Um, my parents were both musicians. My father taught himself how to play guitar and my mother sang a little bit when she was in school. But I think I'm more identified with my grandmother who uh, had an organ in her house and knew how to play organ and piano and bluegrass banjo. 
believe it or not. So uh, music was always on in my house. You know, we, my mom would wake us up in the morning around 6 o'clock and turn on the radio. And I'd get home after school and the radio would be on. And my dad had a large collection of records ranging from country to opera and blues. So I grew up fairly in, in a musical family. My siblings all played music as well, but I was the only one who stuck with it through high school. Uh, when I was 16 years old, I decided to pick up the saxophone. Uh, I had wanted to play the saxophone in fourth grade, but I had a long walk home from the bus stop and thought that it might be really <laughs> heavy to carry that saxophone case up my hill. So I picked the flute at that time. Um, so in applying for schools and colleges, I, I really thought about studying music and I, I wasn't convinced I wanted to, but I decided to apply to a number of schools that um, had strong music programs. and ended up going to Bard College. You did well. In upstate New York. <laughs> and within a few weeks of being there, um, meeting with my advisor and, and working with him, I, I pretty much knew that I needed to pursue music, that it just kind of fed me and it made sense. So at my time at Bard, I played jazz, uh, saxophone, and classical flute and graduated with a music performance degree and then moved back home to Bethel, Vermont, where I grew up. And that's where I met Scott, who was, like he had just said, trying to start this nonprofit music and art school and needed some help. So that's how we, we met. And he convinced me to start playing the voice uh, double seconds, which is the alto voice of Pan. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been doing that for roughly 10 years, 11 mm -hmm. years. And you get to hear some of that, too. Yeah. Uh, but you... I want to capitalize on something that you said, that music fed you. Yes, absolutely. Although this is a show about drumming, it's amazing how universal <laughs> a lot of these impetuses are. And one of the things that would be great to get across to people is you don't have to be great to do something. If you have the impetus to do it, it brings your life to fuller fruition. And I would really advise checking out creative outlets because it's wonderful. It's been wonderful for me. I don't know. I could never just not have done it. It kind of drew me to wherever I went, where I am now. I totally agree with you. I mean, I can't tell you how many moments I've been in a situation where I'm like, oh, I think I'll try this musical project, not sure how it's going to go. And then suddenly you show up, you do your thing, and you just know that it was meant to be. And that's follow that. That's intuition at its best. I hope you've enjoyed chapter one of our four-part series. Please come back again next week as we continue our talk with Scott Paulson and Barb Smith on The Drumming Show. Remember, if you want to watch the entire show in one piece as it was originally recorded, please visit us at cnow.tv. That's C-N-O-W TV. If you're listening on the audio podcast and want to reach Scott Paulson and Barb Smith, their email address is V as in Vermont, I-S-A, vt at aol.com that's v-i-s-a-v-t at aol.com or reach them by phone at area code 802-234-6987 that's 802-234-6987